I'm Dr. Peter Derman, minimally invasive and endoscopic spine surgeon at Texas Back Institute. Today we're going to talk about the topic of decompression. Before launching into the techniques of decompression, we need to talk about what is being decompressed, and that really is spinal stenosis. Stenosis means pressure on nerves in the spine, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. So some of them might be a disc bulge or a disc herniation that can take up space for the nerves. You can develop bone spurs and overgrown soft tissues as a result of arthritis and kind of age-related wear and tear problems that take up space for the nerves. And then there are other less common reasons that patients can get pinching of the nerves, like trauma and tumors, etc. But the most common are those first two that I talked about. That's the kind of chronic age-related wear and tear arthritis things, taking up space for the nerves, or a disc bulge or disc protrusion that comes out and pushes on them. How do those things manifest? What symptoms do patients get? And usually those symptoms are something to do with the arms or the legs. So not just neck pain, not just back pain, but pain, numbness, tingling, sometimes weakness, or discoordination sometimes going into the arms or into the legs. And that's when we know that the stenosis or nerve compression is actually causing symptoms. Because interestingly, you can have stenosis and have no symptoms, and that's okay. But if your stenosis is starting to cause symptoms, then that's where maybe treatment comes into play. Now, I'm a spine surgeon, I love to do spine surgery, but I try to avoid spine surgery, and we tend to try to start with the non-surgical things. So even for stenosis, this can be beneficial. So you start with physical therapy, judicious use of non opioid medications, sometimes we do injections, and a lot of the times that is enough to help people recover from their symptoms of stenosis without the need for surgery. However, if these symptoms persist and they're bothersome, or if there are certain red flags like you know severe weakness or something like that, that's where surgery really comes into play. Now decompression surgery means taking off the pressure. And so at a high level, that really means cleaning out around the nerves. There are a variety of different ways that this can be done all throughout the spine, but the traditional way, especially in the low back where this is commonly performed, is called a laminectomy. What a laminectomy does is addresses the wear and tear, bone spurs, overgrown tissue causes of nerve compression. And it involves going in and cleaning out those structures. Um, you can also have a similar thing coming from a disc bulge as we talked about. Treatment of that, the decompressive surgery for a disc bulge is called a discectomy or a microdiscectomy, and it's a similar type procedure. These are traditionally done from the back using an open incision. So depending on what needs to be cleaned out and how many levels, how extensive the surgery is, the incision can vary in size, um, but it involves opening it up and basically removing or moving out of the way the muscles that overlie the spine so the surgeon can peer down and see the spine and basically use a variety of instruments and tools to take the pressure off, whether that be the bone spurs or the disc bulge or some combination of the two. Patients wake up and oftentimes they have incredible improvement in their leg or arm symptoms as soon as they wake up. So this is very, very gratifying type surgery. Um, there's other ways of doing this, less invasive ways of doing this, including something called tubular retractors, which is something that involves operating through a tube using special magnifying lenses or a, or a microscope that helps the surgeon do a very similar procedure, but with a smaller incision and less muscle disruption, allowing for a faster recovery. And then at the least invasive range of the spectrum are endoscopic techniques, which again similarly accomplish the same exact goals of surgery, decompression, uncompressing the nerves, but through an even smaller incision with even less muscle and soft tissue disruption. Patients after these decompression surgeries, as I mentioned, often feel much better immediately, and then oftentimes even go home the same day, depending on how these procedures were performed. Now, in certain instances, just a decompression is insufficient, and patients might need stabilization in addition to the decompression. What does that mean? Some patients have compression of their nerves, not just because of a bone spur or a disc herniation, but because the, the bones themselves are unstable and they're sliding around. That's called spondylolisthesis. Or the spine has a deformity, a curvature, 
And it's possible that that curvature or deformity is a primary contributor to the reason the nerve's being decompressed. In instances like these, stabilization is necessary as well to put the bones back where they belong and then hold them there so that the pressure can be alleviated from the nerve. And that's, that's often called a fusion operation. There are a variety of different ways of doing fusions, ranging from the traditional to the minimally invasive, but in certain cases, that fusion can be added to the decompression if additional stability is needed. Spinal stenosis or pinching of a nerve is diagnosed using a couple of different modalities. So the first and the most important is talking to and examining your patient. So everyone who comes in, we take a very detailed history and listen for certain cues, certain things that they tell us, which is very common for these kind of problems. For instance, for spinal stenosis, patients often report heaviness, discomfort, achiness, generalized weakness in their buttocks and legs. That's worse when they stand and walk distances, better when they lean forward or when they sit down. And some people even say, hey, I can't walk more than a block, but if I lean forward on a shopping cart, I find that I can walk for much farther. And when I hear those words, even before I've seen an MRI or x-rays or anything else, I already have an idea in my mind, hey, this patient has a high likelihood of having spinal stenosis going on. So first is you listen to the patients. The next thing that you do is you examine the patients. And there's a variety of things that you can find that can point toward or away from a spinal issue as a cause of these kind of symptoms. For instance, you can get those very similar symptoms that I was just talking about from a vascular problem. So if your blood vessels have blockages in them, it, blockages in them, it can occlude the blood flow to your legs and give very similar type symptoms. And so that's why we look at every patient very closely to see if they have evidence of poor blood flow too, which might point us actually away from the spine. Because the last thing you want to do as a specialist is get blinders on and only think about the problem that you personally address and not think outside the box. So you talk to the patient, you examine the patient carefully, and then imaging studies come into play. And that's where we always get x-rays. So x-rays show us the patient's structural spine and how they stand and how they move. That can be very helpful and is an initial first step. And then an MRI can also be helpful in certain instances to show us the nerves and the soft tissues and the discs themselves. So an MRI is sometimes a next step, especially if a patient is not responding to the early phase of non-surgical treatment because an MRI gives us a little bit of a better idea exactly where the symptoms can, are coming from and can target things like injections or potentially surgery afterwards. There are some additional ancillary tests that we sometimes get if there's any question remaining. Something called an EMG can be very helpful and can help us pin down whether the stenosis that we might find on an MRI is actually causing symptoms. That's a study that's done in the office. Some of our uh, physiatry, physical medicine, and rehabilitation partners here at Texas Back are very skilled at doing those studies, and it can give us a lot of additional information about where symptoms are coming from. Patients can develop stenosis for a variety of different reasons. Many people think they have to be in a big accident or fall out of a tree when they were 12 or be attacked by a shark or something like that. And while I encourage people to think of a really good story to tell their friends, the vast majority of people, this just kind of comes out of nowhere. For the kind of chronic patients who develop bone spurs and overgrown tissue type stenosis, this is a very gradual progression over time. And they often just gradually, gradually develop these symptoms. Sometimes it can come on more quickly, at least the symptoms come on quickly, but the underlying problem has been developing slowly over time. And their nerves have been able to adjust and compensate and compensate to a point, but then the stenosis or the tightness around the nerves just gets to a point that they can't compensate any longer, and they start to develop these symptoms going down in their arms or their legs. The other thing is some people can acutely develop things like disc herniations. So disc herniations are a result of a piece of the disc, which is the shock absorber between the bones in the spine, bulging or protruding out and pinching on the nerves. And this oftentimes happens more rapidly. So patients are you know, going about their life and then suddenly they develop these symptoms. It can be associated with a certain event, you know, lifting something heavy, bending and twisting, um, but oftentimes it's not and it doesn't have to be. 
If you're experiencing heaviness in your legs, pain, numbness, tingling, weakness in the arms or the legs, this certainly could be a symptom of spinal stenosis or a pinched nerve in the spine. Feel free to reach out to us, this is what we do. We can evaluate you carefully and develop a plan to help you feel better, whether that's without surgery, hopefully, or with something from a minimally invasive perspective, we can help you feel better.